Welcome to episode 17 of Cyclops is Waiting for Me, an X-Men animated series weekly recap podcast. I'm Rod. You can look up my music. I'm a songwriter on Spotify and Apple Music or wherever kids get music now these days. Do you really just try to sound more and more like a boomer every episode we do? I'm embracing my age now. (laughs) And I'm JC, and probably by this point, when this episode goes live, I'll have read the second issue of X-Men 92, House of 92. Which you were a huge fan of. Oh, God, I (laughs) I really hope that the second issue is better than the first issue. That'll be on our Instagram. Cyclops is Waiting for Me is our weekly podcast series. We're going back and watching every single episode of the original 1992 X-Men the Animated Series from their original intended script order building up to the release of X-Men 97 coming to Disney Plus in 2023. And I saw a date online, which I don't feel like is real, but it said April of next year. Okay, well, let's... Which kind of works out for us really well if there's oh, nice. 70 ish episodes of our show. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting my hopes up though. Until, until Disney announces it, I don't trust the internet rumors. And even then, yeah. we don't know. Like these Marvel days get pushed around all the time. Some quick reminders. We're a recap show about a series that came out 29 years ago. Once again, just embracing my age. There will be spoilers. If you don't want to spoil it for you, pause the podcast, watch the episode and come back. We'll do our best to avoid mentioning anything about future episodes we haven't covered yet. We're currently not sponsored or affiliated with Disney or Disney Plus in any way, but there's still time. There is. There is still time. (laughs) You are not wrong about that. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Cyclops IWFM pod on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter and Facebook. And of course, follow us on your favorite podcast services. Again, just a reminder, if you follow us on Facebook, it will automatically give you an RSS feed for the mobile only version of Facebook to your phone. Is just mind boggling. Finally, we record these episodes in batches. So if we're reacting to something that's news, etc., we might be a few weeks behind. And that's why I make comments about already hating an issue of a comic book (laughs) that I haven't read yet. Just predicting. I mean, the first issue is just, it's really bad. If, if somebody is curious, will I like this if I've read the House of X story or loved the original animated series? Still probably no. <laughs> Great endorsement. Yeah. Now onto the show. Today we're going to be talking about season two, episodes seven and eight, titled Time Fugitives, part one and two. They aired on December 11th and December 18th, 1993 respectively, and both set an 8.2 star rating on IMDb. And here I am. Once again, being the lead on a recap of one of the Days of Future Past Time episode double partners. <laughs> that was completely unintentional. I'm not even messing with you. That That's just how it randomized. That's cool. It's my specialty now is time travel. Yeah, you, you, you the guy who is like, I'm going to take arduous notes yeah. because I can't remember anything that happened five minutes ago has to deal with the time travel stories. I have a clip from one of the episodes we recently recorded where you said Rod has the memory of a goldfish and I, I don't even, it's not even on your socials or anything. I just have it there as a reminder to myself like that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> it's episode. like, hey, I haven't spoken to JC today. I'm going to bully myself <laughs> by listening to this clip. <laughs> I mean, the the, la- the the clip that we did post was about if Sinister put a thing on Cyclops' dick or not, so. And also, I just <laughs> got to point out with that, the edit of the clip is so weird because the bleep is before you say dick. Yeah. <laughs> so you hear beep dick. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's futuristic. I know. Okay. You know, technology. <laughs> Anyway, so this one starts off kind of confusing was once again, I whenever something's confusing, I assume it's either time travel or the danger room. And this one, it was the, the first thing. So we're back in a future, but this time it's thirty nine ninety nine in New York, which is a couple thousand years, even further along than two ships. Two thousand. Yeah. Yep. Two thousand. In my head, a couple always means two. So I don't know. Anyway, but they're straight up doing a Terminator opening. It is very clearly that's the inspiration even this the look of the the machines and stuff yeah my note was there are three terminator robots crushing a teal robot and i did see a bunch of notes that actually compared the teal robot to war machine but i oh, didn't get no. the vibe off of it from the design and i i distinctly remember the war machine outfit from the comics at the time and it still didn't connect with me on there and we you know minor spoiler we see him a little bit later and it's not quite the same it's okay to spoil something <laughs> in the same episode rod that's not spoiler territory i, I just I want to keep the anticipation keep you listening we're only a few <laughs> minutes in <laughs> if you came here for war machine i want you to click out now anyway cable's fighting we don't i don't know who's with him but the lady that's with him kind of looks like grace jones if you know who she is 
just the you were the most boomer I ever. <laughs> The fact that we are so close in age and you are so much more of a boomer than I am is unreal. So the character names I got off the internet for these, you had Hope, Dawnsick, Brack, and you had Kane. I cannot verify if any of those are the actual names for those people. That was the only source I found online because somebody on the fandom of this page, like fandom is a great site mm -hmm. because it's very similar to Wikipedia where people can contribute what yeah. they want to contribute. So you get some episodes that will literally just be the date it aired and like, who the characters that are in it and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Then you have ones that are like 37 page wiki entries. <laughs> this was one of those. So I give some credit to that. If you've gone through this much trouble to pull names, you're probably right. Yeah. The only thing that trips me up is I don't know if there was a Hope who came from a prior story, but the mutant that is currently in the X-Men comics who is named Hope is definitely not this same one in, in the future with Cable. Yeah. But I digress. Also, we're like, you know, a, f a few thousand years ahead of the X-Men that we knew, so maybe there's just recycling names by this point. Well, the, ho the, the irony is the hope in the current X-Men universe was a baby who got pulled into the future with <laughs> Cable and grew up in like this weird fucked up timeline scenario. We're, we're just into sci-fi soap operas. We just have to acknowledge that. <laughs> I, have, I have no arguments yeah. with that, Rod. Regardless, all of those characters... Regardless of hope. Yeah, regardless of hope. All those characters seem to be kind of inconsequential to the story here. They're just there, like, in the background. We quickly find out that Apocalypse is responsible for whatever's happening in this current situation, including the Terminator robots. And a temporal storm appears uh, above Apocalypse. Bishop is floating in it, but he's not directly affecting things just yet. People start getting sucked into this like time tornado thing, including the was Grace Jones Lady Hope. Oh, I, we don't know the, I don't know who okay. was who, to be so honest. The, by la the, name. the lady that was closest to Cable, she gets sucked in first. That seems to kind of shake up Cable a little bit. Cable asks his little square computer cube computer thing. What's which he going just on? calls computer. Yeah, he yeah. he just keeps calling computer, which is a very nineties thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that it is just the the proper name. Like when he yeah. says it in his mind, he's saying computer with a capital C. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like that's its name. It's computer. And the computer explains that the time stream is realigning because something in the past has changed in a major way. So that time tornado thing is actually just readjusting their future. But then she elaborates that their world will cease to exist. So it's less realigning and just destroying their future. Well, yeah, I think you need to approach it from the perspective as it's not destroying it if it never actually came to be. Yeah. It's it's more so unmaking it mm -hmm. rather than destruction. And my note here was, but would that kind of be for the best? Because they didn't seem to be happy in the future. It doesn't right? seem like a great future. <laughs> like, like Rod... Rod mentioned the Terminators, and I think anybody who knows anything about the Terminators is, if you're in a world where there are robots fighting humans, yeah. probably a pretty shitty world. I would probably just take a shot of whiskey and be like, you know, we had a good run. This is a good way to end <laughs> our timeline, you know, because you're, you're not really dying, right? That tornado thing is just going to make you like not exist anymore. I, I think that's <laughs> easy for us to say because we don't know what it feels like to be unmade. That's true. I don't want to hurt, but if it came down to like, you know, going the regular way that we know in our real world and just like having a time vortex just you know <laughs> well, uncreating us <laughs> isn't isn't the theory that if you were to get sucked into a black hole in re in earth's perception it would happen in less than a second but you would feel that pain for what is the equivalent of a thousand years of your perception i did not know that that's horrible that's a that's a theory about how time distortion happens around black holes that makes sense because the whole gravity affects time is that sucks oh science is scary science is super <laughs> scary the only thing that scares me more is the stuff that's underwater where fish need to have like bioluminescence right and the, the megalodon <laughs> megalodon doesn't scare me as much as a fish that has a flashlight in front of its forehead <laughs> Those things are freaky. Yeah. So computer tells Cable that Bishop is responsible for all of this. And I, th I think he looks up and sees Bishop swirling in the temporal storm or whatever. And then we follow Bishop back to his future in 2055, where we last left him in Days of Future Past. Everything is still the same. Except here was one thing that did, didn't did line up to me. When you see Bishop make his return, which is seemingly from stopping the assassination of Ke Senator Kelly, the world didn't look shitty outside because he looks outside and the world mm -hmm. looked actually nice-ish. It yeah. didn't look as like everything is destroyed as this, much. This time around. Right? This time. Yeah, yeah, it looked um, a little bit better. Yeah, it looked like it was a little bit better and we see Forge at the control panel similar to the end of Days of Future Past. Mm -hmm. 
with the Wolverine skeleton in the which is so still so disconcerting. <laughs> I, I mean, it's literally Wolverine skeleton. So yeah. yeah. And Forge starts talking about a plague. We figure out that Forge doesn't have any memories of the future that's changed because he's resided in that future. Yeah, he he has no concept of stopping the assassination mm-hmm. because with whatever happened with Kelly not being assassinated, a different issue came to be that brought their reality back to let's let's assume that it was an animation mistake of yeah. <laughs> everything outside not looking shitty. The world is still pretty messed up and he gets he catches up Bishop on it. And there was two of the Days of Future Past mutants, the one that fought with Bishop and and Wolverine when they were attacking the Sentinels. And you also see, in particular, some of the mutants who are getting sick. And the person who you asked me about if they had any significance in the Muir Island episode, which was the purple-headed helmet lady. Okay, yeah, yeah. It was one of those mutants that you see getting sick there. So... I, again, I don't think it, I don't think she's significant because I can't find her in anything outside of the show. But similar to little green guy from the yeah. intro, that character has popped up as a character model. They just yeah, they just kept the drawings for it, like just yeah. throw them back. They're like, there. well, we own this design, so we're gonna <laughs> fucking use it. And so Forge explains that President Kelly fought for mutant rights, and in in lieu of what had happened before. A genetically engineered virus is created, and once it hit mutants, it mutated into something really uncontrollable and fatal. And it became deadly, because mm-hmm. the the premise is before it hit mutants, it was not deadly. It was when it was only in humans that it was just getting them sick. Yeah. And so Forge sends Bishop back to stop the plague, and Bishop lands, it looks like, in the same alley or a very similar one. And he says, here we go again. You did miss one important thing okay. from uh, Forge, though. Forge did not recognize the X-Men when... That's right. When Bishop said, you know, me and the X-Men saved President Kelly, and he's like, who were the the X-Men? Yep. And Bishop goes up to a newsstand again to read the headlines, and he he leaves like a futuristic currency. Well, the the part that was an odd choice here was the plague had already started at this point. Mm -hmm. So even though it was not a plague in the, like, you know, Black Death medieval sense where it was killing a bunch of people, you would think that for a time traveler... Yeah you probably should have gone back a few weeks earlier to try to stop this thing at the source. And then there was like a pseudo allusion to the Hulk where there was this like creepy green guy who looked like a Frankenstein on a newspaper. I I don't know if that was just like random. Yeah, or it may have just been like random, like weekly world news style, like shock art or something like that. Oh man, kids, get your parents to tell you about the National Enquirer. I'm just gonna stay on this boomer trail. You really are. (laughs) The Bat Boy thing. Well, and stuff. that was Weekly World News. Yeah. That was like, Inquirer was like trashy celebrity stuff. Okay. And Weekly World News was like, hey, we discovered another mermaid. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, I just, I clumped it all into the Inquirer stuff. Yes. But sorry, I cut you off about the future oh. future money. Oh, yeah. I, I was like, is this is this a, like a physical manifestation of a Bitcoin or something? Because even the, the newsstand guy was like, what the hell is this? He I do, he, he I do love that in our first episode with Bishop, he's getting paid on essentially like a debit card. Yeah. And now he has future coin in his pocket. Yeah, in, in a future that was affected by a plague. This doesn't check out. Anyway. <laughs> Phys- physical money. Yeah. The best way to avoid plagues. So then we catch up with Jubilee and Storm. They're at the mall. Jubilee's favorite place. Yeah, and this is possibly one of the most 90s situations that could happen. Jubilee needs to get a CD player fixed. Which There's so many things in that. I don't know. It, even if there were CD players, would you fix it? You would just get a new one, right? That's now or an iPod or iPhone would be like the current. Then it would depend. Because, well, no, then you would get fixed. Yeah. But because I remember my first Discman was so expensive that we would get it repaired. Right. But, if, you, if you got the the sports Discman, with the, which were the ones that had impact protection. Yeah. Because we dealt with a thing <laughs> that if you tapped your CD player while the CD was playing, it would skip. Oh, yeah. Or breathe on it or something. <laughs> and I think the sport one was also waterproof. It was waterproof. Yeah. That was, it was yellow. It's oh, This is so dope. It's sealed. Like you actually yeah. could seal it. Yeah. God, and we're old, Rob. Yeah. So Jubilee is getting her CD player fixed. So while that's happening, Storm says she's going to go to the bookstore and wait on her. Like all of that is just so much 90s stuff. The repairman. The fucker books. Right. <laughs> There were other Barnes and Nobles that weren't Barnes and Nobles back in the day. The repairman takes the CD player back to the back room to fix it uh, for some reason that he couldn't do it in front of Jubilee. I think he had to like look to see if there were like parts or something. Yeah. 
and that's just asking for your store to be robbed by kids in the 90s outside the store there's an unnamed guy that sees jubilee walk in the store and presumably storm as well and he 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 like scans through a database of mutants and recognizes jubilee on his watch on his watch the one thing i i i laughed at during that is he's scanning through and it's very much just all the Mm x-men except you get to one that is wolverine's face very obviously wolverine's face but it's miscolored and it looks like saber tooth color combination oh they just got confused yeah somebody must have just not realized it and they put they the the funny part is it is saber tooth's comic book color combination Uh as opposed to the show where he has the brown across his like forehead into his nose okay so it really was like the wolverine face yeah but with that blondish hair and such i wonder too because i just learned this little bit of trivia about bob's burgers so i didn't notice this because i don't follow the show that crazy but in the show whenever kids are eating tacos in the lunchroom they're eating like hamburgers from the top and so the trivia I heard, and maybe somebody can corroborate this, but from everything I read, it was because when they send the animation out to the Korean animation studio, they send notes and they just follow them to a T. Right. Originally, the script had them eating cheeseburgers and someone in the scripting decided it was a taco joke needed to be in there. So they changed the thing to tacos, but didn't specify in the notes that they should eat them from the side. So the animators in, in Korea just animated them eating tacos like cheeseburgers. So I'll give a shout out to the guys over at iFanboy. They they talk about in comic books today, mm-hmm. anytime uh, a book they're reading and somebody picks up a slice of pizza, mm-hmm. how they pick it up, because the guys are are based out of the Northeast, like New mm-hmm. Yorker, they are they are the same level of pizza snobbery that I am. Oh, where you can fold it. And like they start talking about the quality of the pizza <laughs> based on if somebody's eating it properly and the way the cheese like folds and stuff like that. Yeah. So we went on this really weird tangent, <laughs> but it's all really important. Yeah. 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 So I I wonder if that was a thing where maybe it was another character. At a where time even if it said Sabretooth yeah. and they just, it was a Wolverine drawing and or something. Someone just made an executive decision because this show was on such a tight timeline. And of course, Saban is known to have been really tight yeah. from a production budget scenario. So they spotted it, but it was too late to send yeah. it back for, for it to be recolored. And it was, it, at the end of the day, didn't have a huge impact on the story. Not so. at all. The point was that he Only nerds like us right? will talk about it. <laughs> Literally 29 years later. Yeah. And he, he recognizes Jubilee, so he goes into the store. We don't quite know, but just once again, cartoon logic, we'll pull that card out. He gets past Jubilee and to the back room with like a gun that gasses the room. I initially thought it was like a knockout gas or something, but we see the repairman comes out of the back room and he's just visibly got like the flu or something. So he wasn't knockout gassed or whatever. And we find out later. Yeah, he's like, sweating and stuff mm-hmm. like that. He has what they call like a techno virus, which checks out because he has like circuit board stuff on the skin. Yeah, they're, they're like lesions that break out on his skin, but they are very harsh corners to mm-hmm. them. And... You know, we don't get the the full name until Cable refers to it later, but it's essentially referred to as a techno virus. Mm-hmm. And Storm overhears the conflict from the bookstore, and she goes over to try to help Jubilee. She fogs up the area. Well, her- she she fogs up the area because as the clerk is showing signs of infection, mm-hmm. this guy starts yelling out, "Oh, oh yes. she's a mutant! Mm-hmm. She's a carrier!" Yeah, and that's the way of putting the blame of of the infection on the mutants. Yeah, and it's it. I don't know if this was on purpose or not. It's it's kind of interesting. So maybe it was a little bit in a reference to the Japanese internment stuff or whatever, but the first mutant that we see in the show that gets accused of being a carrier of the virus is Jubilee, who is a, a Chinese-American girl. It also kind of reflects what we had in the real world experienced early on in the... Re- I don't even have to say what it is. Everybody in the world knows what happened. That people who aren't responsible for these things get blamed for them. And, you know, just mob mentality. Like you see, you see one person yells something, they yell loud enough, everybody, you know, jump dog piles onto it and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's why Storm fogs up the area to try to get Jubilee out of there. Yep. And she snags her through the fog and they exit by busting out of a skylight. Because <laughs> Storm is super subtle. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's like a sliding door like right there. <laughs> I mean, she didn't need to fly high because I'm sure she could have just gone down out the front door of the mall. Not everybody knew that Jubilee was being accused of being a carrier. Yeah. But no, fuck your skylight. <laughs> yeah, and also this fog storm that's happening inside the mall now. Yep. I just got a mango White Claw. 
John, so I'm gonna. This might be. The, is this the first or second time I drink on here? I don't remember. I drink every time, so. Oh, you know this is this is good because I normally don't like mango flavored things because you know how some people have that cilantro thing where it tastes like soap. Yeah, of course. Mango tastes like raw meat to me, but I'm I was just assuming that. White Claw is not using actual mangoes in it. Oh, God, so. no. There's definitely no mango in there. <laughs> so that, it doesn't taste like that. It just tastes like a fruity. No, similar to how this virus was made in a lab, <laughs> so was this mango flavoring. From there, Beast gives a nice little dig while letting Jubilee know that she's healthy by all yeah. accounts, except she needs to eat more vegetables. <laughs> yeah. And everybody can be like jacked and blue-haired, man. Yeah. Beast gives the very appropriate phrasing of only scientific inquiry can overcome the hysteria gripping the country. And we can leave it at that. So when Beast decides to do some investigating of his own, he breaks into the hospital and he looks at the medical files of the store clerk. Mm -hmm. He notices something weird in the file that we catch up with the rest of the X-Men in the war room. And they're watching video footage or a news report of the forced quarantine of mutants. Yep, it's um, it's a it, it's a news report. It's pretty live, yeah. And then Storm recognizes one of the protesters or mob people. The the, the guy report. who was calling out Jubilee specifically. In the news report is one of the guys from the mall. Then Bishop shows up at the protest, tries to break it up, but in the most violent way he can imagine. He does. So when they, they jump over to, to the forced quarantine where it's not even that people are being like, these mutants are being forced to quarantine. I'm just going to, I'm going to skip over calling it protesters because they're getting violent at yeah. that point it's right it's right it's, yes it's a right it's like a witch hunt yeah and you see mole who was the mutant that was getting bullied a, a couple episodes ago mm-hmm. by the friends of humanity he's the one that looks kind of just like a tiny bigfoot for lack yeah. of a, he's like a chibi bigfoot yeah. essentially with with little glasses he's like an urkel yeah he's he's, <laughs> he's the nerdy mutant with a taller reptilian mutant and her name is scale face i feel really bad i feel like oh, yeah. i feel like some of these morlock-esque mutants just get the meanest names possible right. Well, then there, there was a, what the a couple episodes back there was like hairball and and gorgeous George hairbag 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 and gorgeous George. Yep, that's the raw end of the stick. There is it hairbag or fur bag? I think it was hair yeah. bag. Regardless, yes. it, it, that's the raw end of the stick because you're on the same team as someone. It's gorgeous George. George. Yeah, <laughs> who equally as ugly if we're yeah. going to be totally honest. <laughs> but yeah, the the friends of humanity takes a shot at Bishop. Little do they know, shooting at Bishop, not the best plan. Yeah. And Storm and Rogue arrive and report to everybody else that Bishop is there. We find out that Gene, Cyclops, Gambit, Wolverine are in the Blackbird, very like close behind them. Wolverine jumps Bishop, but quickly just gets you know, tossed to the side. And then there's a big pile on on top of Wolverine. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so Storm makes it rain to scare everyone away because I know this is supposed to be New York, but it sounds like Los Angeles. This is how you get people to be like, go away. Yeah, New York, nobody <laughs> will care. New York, they'll start shooting at the sky if it's raining. <laughs> and then in the middle of this whole fight, Rogue takes a Friends of Humanity guy and like throws him in a dumpster and kicks him down the street. And that guy's pretty much dead, right? I don't know if it would kill him. It, it all depends on what's in the dumpster. I mean, it looked like it went downhill. So I don't know, I guess. <laughs> I, again, I think it depends on what's in the dumpster. If mm-hmm. he's on like... Like garbage bags with food waste could yeah. act as a buffer, like a, like a <laughs> like an airbag. Yeah. If he's in there with like rebar, yeah. he's fucked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Cyclops yells at Bishop. This time, I gotta agree with Cyclops. <laughs> I hate saying the phrase because actually, I like saying the phrase because I know it yeah. pisses Rod off. <laughs> but in this case, I actually agree with Cyclops that Bishop made it worse. Yeah. Then we catch up with Beast. He figures out that the virus is created in the lab. We just trust it because it's Hank. We do see some weird animation of like these like claw-like things jumping on cells and stuff. Yeah, so I, I believe that is their way of showcasing what the actual virus looks like. Mm-hmm. And it's very much like what you would see in textbooks when they show you what a virus looks like. Obviously, with modern 3D technology, we're, we're a little closer to what these viruses really do look like, yeah. especially recent events. But the classic version made them look almost robotic and non-organic, coinciding with cells which were, you know, a little more like blobby type stuff. Yeah, and they, they were a little less crystalline than the ones I remember seeing, but a little more like, like nanotech kind of too, just the way they were set up and stuff. It was, it, it, it got the visual message across. Like it, 10 year old me figured out that these were parasites. Basically. It looked like if you played Geometry Wars on the original Xbox 360, it oh, looks wow. like the little like hard edge villains you'd shoot in Geometry yeah, Wars. Yeah, totally, that's it. 
Uh, Everything after the 90s <laughs> stole from this show. Exactly. And Beast says that he can tell that the virus isn't very dangerous right now, but it is unstable and it'll become deadly and fatal once it hits the like the mutant genetic code or whatever. So Cyclops says they need President Kelly to, to help them. Presumably in the in the form of a hearing that they have a little bit later. So we cut to the Friends of Humanity headquarters, and Creed is congratulating some guy that apparently created the virus. We don't find out who he is, and they want to infect the X-Men, but particularly Beast at the hearing that's going to happen so that the whole world sees that a mutant is carrying the virus on national television. Creed walks away, and then the eye guy makes his eyes glow because apparently everybody wants to cut it really thin like about getting caught as a villain in the show. <laughs> the other villains are kind of idiots. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and part of the added benefit is, you know, Creed with, with all his bigotry and stuff, he considers beast president Kelly's little pet almost yeah. because he's the mutant that president Kelly loves. Yeah. And then Creed is speaking at, I guess it's hearing. That's yeah. Going we, we, on national, it's not just television. We see people like in spaceships and shit, like watching this thing. Yeah. We, we see a few different scenarios where where Creed mentions that he has the names of 5,000 people who were infected through contact with mutants. And what this was reminiscent to me is there is something known as the Hollywood Blacklist, which mm-hmm. happened around the 1950s. And it was a list of people who were accused of being communist sympathizers. And... The whole list, I can't say, was there wasn't a single person on there who who wasn't one because I I haven't done enough research Mm -hmm. on it. But essentially, this was a way that people were using the fear of the start of the Cold War to get people in Hollywood blacklist. And it eventually became known as the Hollywood blacklist. And, you know, if you look it up on on Wikipedia, the list is like 100 plus names of various people, writers, producers, actors, directors. And it this ruined their career Mm -hmm. and it was accepted and it went to congressional hearings and a lot of people ended up losing their livelihoods because they wouldn't like go and testify in congress because how do you how do you disprove this accusation if you're not guilty of something in this it's the burden of truth scenario yeah and there was no burden of truth to prove they were communists it was proved to me that you're not a communist yeah it's kind of like the if the woman drowns and she's not a witch. Right. You know, like, okay, well, what good does that? Okay, sure. Yeah, now she's know. dead like, and she wasn't a witch. <laughs> so, yeah, Creed has a very, like, conspiracy against big government, you know, vibes. It's, it's, it's not settling because he doesn't have anything to substantiate any of his claims. Right. He just scares people. And we see a few people watching. Like you were mentioning, there's this dude with a green head who mm-hmm. I didn't recognize. And apologies if somebody did. I, yeah. Like I, I said, I... I reference like six or seven different websites when I do recaps for this to try to figure it out. Don't know who the green guy was, but we do see a S.H.I.E.L.D. group, which is the original Nick Fury, yeah. back before Sam Jackson took over the when, vibe of Nick Fury. When he was David Hasselhoff. <laughs> God damn it, Rob. Please, please don't bring that back hey, up. Hey, kids, go look up that. Al- David Hasselhoff was once Fury. Alongside <laughs> War Machine. And then another member of S.H.I.E.L.D., which Rod did not recognize. I did not. Nor, nor would I expect you to, because this was such a classic iteration of S.H.I.E.L.D. in the 90s. But the character's name was G.W. Britt. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't recognize. I, I, I don't even recognize that name now. He's He is not modern day significant. Gotcha. So, yep. Oh, that's a, that sounds like something you say to hurt someone's feelings. <laughs> I'm going to now. <laughs> so... Part of the group, obviously, they're watching this as the X Men, and then Rogue. I, th- I think I know. I don't think I know. She called him this, but I had to rewatch it to make sure. She calls him a peckerwood. I don't know what that means, but that's hilarious. I think, unless it's something offensive. I'm it. pretty sure <laughs> it's it's just like like southern it's, slang. It's, it's southern slang. You're calling him like a woodpecker. Yeah, but peckerwood is funnier. Yeah, and also I guarantee was said around this time on Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, and then like not too long later, Rogue calls all the humans that are yelling at the mutants at the hearing rednecks. Which Which she's not wrong. Yeah, but also hilarious. Given her (laughs) accent. And I think this was around the same time when Jeff Foxworthy was really big and stuff. So like like rednecks was it was it it wasn't uncommon to hear, you know. When did (laughs) Jeff Foxworthy I don't care that he was born in nineteen fifty eight. His show okay. His show debuted in September of 1995. So, oh, so this, so this was pre 
the like redneck comedy jam. Okay, so you heard of your first rogue inspired Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> I guarantee if we watched enough Jess Foss worthy comedy, we would hear him call somebody a peckerwood. <laughs> I don't want to watch Jeff no, Fox worthy yeah. comedy. Anyway, there's a big fight that breaks out because Bishop sees Creed kind of try to sneak like a little thing to shoot. We don't actually ever see it work, but a little thing to get Beast infected with the techno virus. Which it looks, the device physically looked like the thermometer that a doctor would put in your ear. Oh, yeah. But it was kind of sharp. It looked like it might puncture. It, it was like pointy. But yeah, if you ever look at those things from a distance, they look like they could yeah, you know, stab your damage. skull. So, you know, Bishop jumps in. The Friends of Humanity start shooting at the security <laughs> for the hearing, which I can't imagine is a great idea to get invited back. Yeah. And at that point, during all the kerfluffle, let's go with kerfluffle. Oh, That's yeah. a good word. Creed ends up infecting himself because he's unable to get close enough to infect Beast. Yeah, I, I assumed it was by accident, and also because bigots tend to not be the smartest people in the world. I mean, they're, bigots are definitely <laughs> fucking idiots, and again, quote me on that anytime you want. But I, I think because Bishop broke it up, he wasn't actually able to get close enough because it wasn't okay. like it wasn't like the gun in the 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 Radio Shack room where it was a missed gun. It was a lot more concentrated, so I think he had a puncture. My okay. vibe was it needed to be like and, yeah. at least make contact sort of scenario. So I I think he. He was like, well, at the very least, I could blame him on infecting me yeah. because he was literally just like right next to me. Yeah. And so Creed breaks out. Once again, the virus is very visual. And so he rips his shirt open. He tells the, you know, the camera crew, like, look at what this did to me. Also, like that I work out because I have visible abs. And which I wasn't expecting for him. Right. <laughs> I mean, good good on him, but yeah. I was not expecting that. He, he works out, you yeah. know, in good genetics, which also foreshadowing. Cyclops on brand yells at Bishop. Again, <laughs> I get it, but this time he was wrong. Yeah, and and they do the they do the computer enhance. Yeah, so that we're in the Blackbird or something. They were in the Blackbird yeah. flying back, and Beast does computer enhance. <laughs> but the interesting thing is the cropping on the computer screen. It's like computer enhance this, and then it actually scans below the edge of the crop, yeah. and then zooms in further. And I'm like. How did the computer get the feed that wasn't actually on the TV? <laughs> you know what? AI. Yep. Mysterious thing. Speaking of, have you seen, there was like a, not not a deep fake, but an AI enhanced intro to the X-Men theme song thing. If you watch it, it's it's almost it, uncanny valley. I know it's a weird it, thing to say about a, a, like a 2D animated thing. Yeah. But like they made it like a 4K version of the animated intro. Mm -hmm. But I guess AI like filled in all the gaps. So it's super smooth, but also it doesn't quite look right. And it is on YouTube. It's just on YouTube, yeah. So we have a playlist on our YouTube channel that is literally just alternate versions of the theme song. So Rod, it is your responsibility to add that video to this theme song playlist. Cool, Rod, when you're editing this, <laughs> remember to do that at that moment because you'll never remember after this. <laughs> and please, when you're editing, leave you leave telling that in. in. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> then we're back with Cable and it's basically just to remind us that we're watching all these events from his point of view of the recap from computer telling him like what happened and stuff. And I love I love you calling it computer. Yeah, just the way you're pronouncing it, like <laughs> it's the capital. C. It's a person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we come back to I don't know what's current and whatever. we're back with the X Men. So so there's <laughs> modern day yeah. Bishop Future Cable, Cable future. future. So we're back in modern day. We're outside of the Friends of Humanity mansion, and which they have two headquarters apparently because yeah. they have a mansion and they also have the shitty like veterans hall. Yeah. Yep. And. So Cyclops asks Jean to you know scan the premises to find Creed. She is able to locate him through her telepathy in the basement or underneath the house. They said underneath yep. the house. They specify they specify that it is under under it. She yeah he, she's like he's not in it. He's under it. Mm -hmm. So I guess maybe not necessarily a basement, but like some secret thing or whatever underneath. And then she scans his whatever mind and stuff. And then she gets to the virus guy, the guy who created the virus. And then she just like gets she goes down. Like something wrong is happening. And apparently that wasn't a red flag and it was the opposite. It was like, that's our go. Like, let's go for it. So the theme song plays is the big epic montage of them breaking into the facility. It's the epic one-sided fight. Like yeah. we had the fight in the very first episode where they were going against the mutant control agency yeah. facility. And you had a little bit of resistance. This was the X-Men just messing up rednecks. Yeah. <laughs> Rogue, and, rogue's words. Yes. Rogue, <laughs> rogue calls them rednecks. And just quick note, 
It was everybody from the team with the exception of Jubilee. And so we're back inside underneath the mansion and Creed is just begging the virus guy to help him because he's he's sick. And right about then. He's, he's also in this version of it. And I say that phrasing very specifically. Yeah. He's a little bit panicked. Yeah. You notice that like he has a little bit so, of a fear to having the infection here. And so that's why I thought that it was by accident. But I guess it could go either way. If he, if he just in a quick snap decision decided he needed to get himself to. Yeah to get the job done. I, was, I could totally see that. He was he was afraid. And then right about then, Cyclops blasts a hole in the wall. You see it from the other side. So we just see the wall like kind of swell and then the blast goes through and then all the X-Men run into the room. Very quickly, Apocalypse reveals that he was the guy, the virus guy. Like, right. And, and that's where it was probably like my favorite moment of this particular episode because Creed instantly identifies Apocalypse as a mutant. And yeah. And Apocalypse is offended by this because he says... I am as beyond mutants as they are beyond you. Yeah. So it's mind. like, you're not even an ant to apocalypse. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a really, really, I don't know. I love, I love, I love apocalypse because that whole like theater actor vibe that they got these voice actors from totally works for apocalypse. Yeah. And then we get a, a little bit of a fight. Apocalypse says my second favorite phrase, which was basically the purity of oblivion to your world. It's yes. like, Geez, you read a lot of the New Testament, specifically the books at the end. Yeah. So Bishop throws like a bomb or something. Uh, It's like an incendiary grenade, I think is a fair way. And once again, it's like this, it's the virus version of like beam in the sky. There's like one tank that contains everything. (laughs) So he blows it up. And so everybody just gets the hell out of there. And Beast specifically rescues Creed and tells him, was this one of your favorite books? I did like okay. I did like this. It's not as good as I am as far beyond yeah. mutants as they are beyond you. But remember, Mr. Creed, a mutant saved your life. I, I love it's such a good middle finger line. I, I love Beast's pettiness. It's so it's 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 like borderline bitchy. And yeah. that's why I like it. <laughs> And so they they all run out and Apocalypse gets pissed. He's like, my beautiful virus. And apparently he's not so far beyond everybody anymore. But he he does grow beyond the size of the mansion. I'm pretty sure that's proof that he's beyond everybody, Rod. (laughs) Like, that's uh, like inarguable proof of how beyond everything he is. (laughs) And he he blows up the mansion just by growing bigger than he. he, He's almost he's as tall as like a big version of the Sentinel. He's like Master Mold size at that point. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good point. And yeah, because Master Mold is the only one of the set size. Sentinels just change whenever they need to. Yeah, those are plot devices. And then he 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 blasts the X Men. We don't actually see them because it's a kids show, but they're gone. Like we know, it's a white light that they yeah. they are they are gone. And so we assume that the virus never spreads, and we catch up with Cable, and he finds out that the reason he was showing all this is because the the mutant plague was needed to create an antibody to like regulate like mutations. Yeah. So so essentially computer says because of the actions of Bishop and the X-Men, the plague never infected mutants. Mm-hmm. What happens from the mutants that are infected by this is it ends up stabilizing the mutant gene. So a bunch of mutants do end up dying because of it, but it actually prevents the mutation of of the mutants as a whole from from evolving from overrunning their their own systems. So you see a few flashes, you see Colossus and Magic, and Colossus is is next to his sister, who looks like she's dying in a bed from the mm-hmm. virus. You see Thunderbird alongside Feral and Cannonball, and, and one of them passes out. You see Cable in his crew, and the rest of the crew fades away. And then you, you get Cable coming to the conclusion of, oh, well, the plague needs to occur for my world to exist. I have to help Apocalypse destroy the past. It's, well, yeah, that's a wild, wild concept. It was a great cliffhanger. You know, it's, it's much more effective of a cliffhanger than just like knocking a beehive down. Yeah, and I, I think, <laughs> I think to some extent, it's kind of like to get the world where we are now. If you believe in a butterfly effect scenario, which mm-hmm. the, at the time where this show was written, butterfly effect was not a phrase within popular culture yeah, that, Ashton Kutcher and- <laughs> the the concept probably existed but it was not something that was was regularly discussed so that would be like somebody saying well if you could go back in time and do anything you'd kill Hitler right mm-hmm. and it's like well if I go back and kill Hitler does the ripple effect mean that time travel is never invented which yeah. literally prevents me from killing Hitler yeah it's a big it's infinity war call it they're like it's back to the future bullshit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's actually a multiverse N- now we're in part two 
a lot of the beginning, the first couple moments and stuff, just reiterate the end of the previous part. So we catch up with the part where Computer says that millions in the past must die so billions in the future can be born. Right about then, Cable's son, Tyler, runs over and cries for help. And the only reason I know his name is Tyler because Cable's look Tyler. Yes. Otherwise, That's I know a that. totally fair reason to know the name <laughs> of that character, no doubt. And so he starts disappearing as he's crying for help. So Cable just immediately takes the time portal back to Bishop. And it makes sense that in 3099, like 2000 years beyond where Bishop was, that the time travel is a lot more like eloquent. And he's able to like time portal back to exactly where Bishop is. And so they arrive roughly around the same time, both like Terminator in and Cable tries to immediately shoot Bishop and they fight. Bishop repeats something he said in Days of Future Past, where he says, for the future, and then tries to tries to blast Cable. And Cable gives a great response during that fight where it's, you can't stop the plague your way. Yeah. And it, it's a really cool thing to hear him say that because he doesn't say definitively, you can't stop the plague. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a glimmer of, of hope of Cable is not determined to damn Bishop's present, mm -hmm. but he knows that if Bishop just does what he did in the previous version of the timeline, then it's yeah, going to destroy a, his future. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little uh, gentler of a Machiavellian <laughs> thing. Like, we don't have to do it a chaotic way. So they kind of, they keep tussling back and forth. Bishop runs away. Cable does a body slide, whatever that means, and intercepts Bishop and JC. Yeah, a, a, bo a body slide is essentially just teleportation in within an area. And the part that you pick up on, the more you see Cable and stuff, is he says body slide by, and he'll mm -hmm. say by one, by two. And that's his way of communicating how many people he's actually sliding with. Mm -hmm. So when he's by himself, it's body slide by one. Later on, he particularly says that with another character, and he says body side by two, and that's why that other character teleports with him. I would love to see Cable in like a crowded room and specify a number, and the com and computer's like, wait, what? <laughs> Which one? Or Cable gets drunk, and he says body slide by pie. <laughs> and then you see a guy teleport into the room next to him, and it's just, just the arm. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, like, that's like if Rick and Morty took over X-Men. It's very Rick and Morty joke. <laughs> so they, they keep fighting. Basically, it's just them kind of chasing each other down the street, but time portaling between each other and body sliding or whatever. And it's with Bishop making his way to that same protest yeah. from the previous episode. And once again, a lot of this episode repeats various sections of part one that we already covered. Cable asks Computer to find Bishop's aura trail, which after you see it through his view, just looks like a fart trail. And... So computer keeps pushing Cable to destroy Bishop. I know it's a non sentient you know, machine or whatever, but it feels like she's getting more aggressive with every step. She's like, kill him, kill him, kill him. She <laughs> she doesn't go hardcore and like get full sentient in like going like the computer from 2001 A Space like Hal, Hal. Yeah. yeah, she doesn't go full Hal, but there is a coldness to computer because of, of the fact that she's computing. Such. Yeah, and like objective. Yeah, in an earlier scene where she's talking about millions must die in the past so future billions are born, she says the phrase, it's mathematically simple. Yeah. And that's like the super cold aspect of, of computer. Yeah. So. Oh, it sucks. And so... Not for us. We're already born. Right. <laughs> that we know of. Simulation. I don't know. Getting a whole... That's another podcast. So... Cable is watching the the news report of the, the the forced quarantine riot thing happening that we saw in part one, and he he runs over to it and and he he appears at the protest. He body slides. He body slides. He that. body slides because a cop. He's in. He he runs into a room. There's a bunch of people who are scared shitless by the giant yeah. guy with the gun, and then they all run out. A cop pulls up, and right as the cop pulls up, he body slides out of there. And he appears on the roof across the street, yep. trying to snipe Bishop. He can't quite bring himself to shoot Bishop. And he he hesitates just enough so that Rogue appears and kind of takes out Cable, at least for a moment. And Rogue recognizes Cable. For whatever reason, Cable doesn't seem to recognize her. Right. And this is, this is really the first episode where we acknowledge that Cable is a time traveler. So the piece that we're not sure about is, is this the first time he has encountered Rogue mm -hmm. or all the stuff that happened on Muir Island, was that the second time he encountered her? Oh, yeah, because 
Yeah, because his, his version might have been, wow, time is a weird. Time is a flat circle. But, and, and the one thing, just for clarity, because we're assuming that most of the people who are listening have also watched the show at this point, mm-hmm. but just in case you haven't, if we're describing certain scenes quickly, it's because they are literally the same scenes from the previous episode, mm-hmm. retold with alterations of a different perspective of the scene or a added person within the scene, you know, because there is the moment where the X-Men are recognizing the guy at the protest, but mm-hmm. we didn't have to go through that All entire that, yeah. scene at the mall again. Yeah, basically part one and two are like, part one was Bishop goes back and tries to change things, and then part two is the same situation, but Cable tries to also interject. It's like a very like looper situation. Yeah, and, and this was one of the things that Eric Lee Wall talked about in the book, where this episode was fun because you got to replay scenes featuring new people, different points of view, but it also saved money because there were certain aspects that you did get to reuse. Even though you were doing some animation on it, you weren't reanimating the entire episode. I was wondering if that was like a cost, not necessarily a cost cutting measure, but like a way to like get more bang for your buck. It was a cost benefit at the at the very least. And. I looked it up just to make sure I was right because we were talking about this a little bit before recording. Yeah, and research, Rod. Uh, yeah, at the moment. This happening. It is called a bottle episode. So I don't know if this would uh, apply to animation, but in traditional like live action sitcoms and stuff, a bottle episode is like whenever you see a season and there's like one episode where they stay in the same room the whole episode or something, it's something so they can cut the budget for that episode to use it for a bigger episode yeah. elsewhere in the season. And some shows where you see that, it, it is also literally like clip show episodes where it's like, oh, yeah. like Michelle Tanner is in a coma, <laughs> so we're going to re- replay highlights from our series and that's yeah. how we're going to end this shit. <laughs> anyway. So C- Cable does eventually pull the trigger to shoot Bishop, but Wolverine gets Bishop out of the way and they have a little bit of a tussle. He called him rookie again at that point, I believe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Which he didn't do in the previous interaction. Yeah, yeah okay. And, oh, yeah, in the part one. In the part one, yeah. And Bishop takes a shot at Cable, but it's, uh, it's much like Tupac at Coachella. It was a hologram. <laughs> I was waiting to see where you were going after saying, <laughs> takes a shot, it's like Tupac. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the only thing I, I give a little bit of discredit to Bishop training is if you shoot something and your shot goes through it, you don't continue to keep shooting through the thing you <laughs> shot through. I mean, Bishop's just uh, shoot first, ask questions later in a very literal sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I 100% <laughs> agree with you on that one. His strategy was not the finest. And we didn't mention this earlier, but when the Blackbird arrived with all the X-Men, it landed on the roof of a building. Yeah, they literally parked their massive ash jet. Like, mm-hmm. this is not even a prop plane. This is a big fucking jet on the roof of a building. So in the middle of all the shooting and fighting and stuff, part of the roof gets blown away. And so the Blackbird starts falling and Jean tries to like hold, and she is holding it up with her mind. Yeah, telekinetically, she's holding it. Very difficult for her. And Rogue sees this happening. So Rogue actually goes and helps her because end of the day, the X-Men will always protect first before Mm -hmm. they engage in a fight. Cyclops starts to fall, but because of, at this point they're, way more cohesive as a team than they were in the first season. So as Cyclops is falling, Storm is there to catch him before he splats. (laughs) So Jean actually kind of didn't even really need to worry about Scott because she's like, we can prioritize. And and there's, there's also something that I think gets used in the comics a lot. We don't see it as much in the show because it's, it's so fast paced and kinetic Mm -hmm. because it's animated. But Jean usually has a telepathic link to the entire team where whether it is the, the field leader who's communicating through her kind of as an internal walkie-talkie system <laughs> or her just telling people what's going on. Yeah. So they could have been communicating and it was kind of one of those, we don't need to show it because they're a team and they're cohesive, yeah. but you can also factor they probably are doing that because they have learned to better communicate in the heat of battle. Yeah, and they're able to coordinate so much better. All that time in the danger room, fighting like that, you know, when Gambit messes up stuff. <laughs> I mean, Scott just doesn't talk to anybody in the danger room. Yeah. And there's a weird, nice little detail that I think is a detail, but Cable takes a Friends of Humanity guy and he throws them against the dumpster instead of into it like Rogue did in the first episode. If that wasn't on purpose, it was an amazing coincidence. So you you keep seeing some back and forth with Cable and Bishop. One thing that stood out to me is when Cable double pumps his gun, it actually shifts the power of the gun. And instead of it being like a single shot 
trying to just shoot Bishop. He ends up double pumping it, hits a car, and then it kind of like absorbs power and then blows up very similar to to Gambit's charging. <laughs> Which is arguably a more dangerous weapon because it doesn't, you know, has that delay and you don't really know what's going on. You're like, why is this thing <laughs> flashing bang? And then Bishop shoots Cable in the arm mm-hmm. and you kind of realize like, oh, for the metal arm, there's, there's, it has a little bit of weakness to it. Yeah, it's just robotic. And so Cable body slides to what he says is HQ. At this point, I have a little bit of a question what HQ is because he's not in his own time, but we're going to explore that a little bit more. So the fight kind of continues, but the X-Men pretty much recover. The, the Frenzy Manity run off and getting themselves together. Cyclops yells at Bishop. Yep. Is it, this is just a punctuation. If, if Bishop and Cyclops are in the same room, if Cyclops is in the same room with people, somebody's going to yell It's just the that. matter of who he's yelling at. <laughs> And then we do catch up with Cable. The HQ he's at looked to me at that time like the repair shop that Jubilee was at. It's not that. Once again, we'll continue later. I'm still just confused of why he specified HQ and they end up in this like ambiguous area. I think it is similar to characters like the Punisher or Nick Fury, mm-hmm. where they just have safe houses. Yeah. And oh, that makes sense. Okay. Given that Cable is a time traveler. Uh huh. And we don't know how many times, if ever, he's come back to this past. Gotcha. We have to assume he's been back here once, uh-huh. whether or not he interacted with the X-Men. And this is just a spot that he has established in this era of, yeah. if I go back here, here's my safe spot to go to. You know, it's always funny to look back at past visions of the future, if that makes sense. It does. The 60s had a very specific vibe for the future. So... This 90s kind of vision of the future, Cable's quote unquote safe house in the past is just like a room stacked with CRT televisions. <laughs> Again, very similar to what the Punisher's safe houses would look like. And so he's at he's at his whatever safe house HQ and he asked computer to to give him his like a basically dossier of all the X-Men stuff. Yeah, his his phrasing was they're not the wimps that I thought they were. And he kind of brushes off Scott and Jean. So yeah. we kind of get a sense that he knows them for some yeah, reason. He actually says, he's like, I know all about them already. And then we go through the other X-Men. And then he pauses at Wolverine and you just see a light bulb kind of click. He doesn't say anything. Well, computer is telling not just who they are, but oh, what yeah, their yeah, power, the power set is. Are. And when he hears Wolverine, it starts to go on to whoever is next in the lineup. Yeah. And he says, go back. Yeah. And so he says, Wolverine can instantly heal. Basically, it's his, his power. And then we return to DC. Beast is actually right before the hearing that we saw in the previous part. He's outside. He's outside and talking to the press. And he says the virus has shown no sign of contact with mutant DNA. Mm -hmm. And and then he's just kind of done with them. He tells them he's not going to give them any more time. And he goes into the hearing. A reporter or somebody. It's a reporter. Yeah. Is in a telephone booth. So he's basically, I think, calling back into like the main office or whatever, that there's going to be like a, a hot tip happening soon and stuff. And in the next booth over, Cable teleports through the landline like it's the Matrix. He kind of does his body slide using the landline. Mm-hmm. And he says, I'm going to reach out and touch somebody. Rod. <laughs> What's that from? Was that AT&T? That is an AT&T okay. commercial that came out in 1987. Yep. So at this point, it was already six years old. Oh, golly. Wow. Yeah. It, I re- you know what's funny? It, I didn't remember that I remembered that. At least it wasn't Where's the Beef. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I can hear that little lady's voice. I can't. <laughs> I don't want to, but no. I can hear it. So he appears. He's outside the hearing room, and we hear the audio from the previous episode. With the oh, fight here. breaking yeah, out. Yeah, the fight starts breaking out and stuff. Cable disables the the security that's getting ready to go into the hearing room so that he can enter. And he goes in, he immediately starts fighting Wolverine. Yeah, so when they're squaring off, you know, they, they start to, to get ready. And Cable calls Wolverine outdated, which is kind of ironic because at this point, we don't have indication as to how old Wolverine as a character mm-hmm. is. But you have Cable who is very battle-worn and also has, like, white hair. So he actually... <laughs> physically looks older but i think it's also because you know he is from the future and wolverine has no concept of where he's from there's a weird detail of cyclops losing his visor that was completely inconsequential to the fight i thought it was going to be something bigger because they they focus on the visor falling to the ground then he just puts it back on and then you know the fight plays out like it did before pretty much creed gets sick and right around that time 
cable body slides with Wolverine HQ in the way that you mentioned with the body slide two. Body slide by two. By two. And as they're body sliding, Gene attempts to scan cable before they're they're disappearing and and he's out of range essentially. Yeah, and we find out at that point. I had my notes. HQ is a CD motel, but it makes a lot of sense where you said it being it's a like safe, a safe house. house. Yeah, he's there. He tells Wolverine what's going on before just shooting him. Well, he he, he, says he tries he, to convince him. He needs his help. There's it's a techno virus. That's where we're formally told that it's. I guess that was the the '90s way of saying it was made in a lab. Is yeah. techno virus? You know, whether it's nanobots or whatever. I don't even think we knew the phrase nanobots. Yeah. Like, <laughs> at that point, Wolverine doesn't believe him, and he kind of like stuns him again, knocks yeah. him out. And we're back in the Blackbird, like we were in the the first part. And Jean reveals that she was able to read a little bit of Cable's mind. Right. And and Jean says he is more important to the future, our future, than you can ever imagine to Scott. Which is some crazy foreshadowing. Yeah. For Scott to not pick up on. Yeah. Well, I don't expect much from Scott these days. <laughs> I, I think he's just scared to yell at Jean. <laughs> Because she's yelling at him in his head. Gene, Gene could just <laughs> shut off the synapses in his brain. That's, yeah. You don't yell at the psychic. <laughs> and I don't even know comics that well, and I know what that meant. So we get back to the, the safe house where Cable and Wolverine are. Cable wakes up Wolverine by throwing a glass of water on him, which I don't know if they do that anymore in shows, but in the 90s, that was like the main way that if you were a tough guy, you'd wake somebody up. In the 90s, lots of people would have water thrown in their face if it was to wake them up because it's supposed to be like the cold water is a shock to your system. Yeah. We also very often saw people start bar fights by throwing drinks at each other's face. Yes. And I can only say I've seen that a dozen times in my <laughs> life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've actually legitimately seen it once. Okay. Yeah. I accidentally, I was guest bartending at an event once and I accidentally spilled wine all over a customer. It didn't start a fight though. That's very different than what I saw, <laughs> which was one of the bartenders may have launched whipped cream across the bar. His aim was off and he ended up hitting a customer and she proceeded to throw her drink in his face. That sounds like a fun night. Our bar was not a good bar. <laughs> but back to Wolverine. Yeah. And so Cable then body slides him and Wolverine to Creed. At least that's what he says. We don't to, the see head, it. to the headquarters. Yeah, to headquarters. Yep. We don't see it immediately, but we see the teleportation. Then we go back to outside the manor and we see the same break in as the first part happen again, completely different music. This is one of the times where even though it was a similar scene, they actually did different animations for some of the, the fight. I was moments. wondering about that because it looked really similar. It was very similar, but it was not just one to one. Mm -hmm. it, at least from my memory from three nights ago, it was yeah. not a one to one for every scene of it. My memory from two hours ago. <laughs> yeah, Rod. I don't remember. How, how <laughs> fucking goldfish. <laughs> And most of that fight is is pretty much the same. Yeah. We we see how I thought this was a cool detail where we see how Cyclops got down to the lab. We see the other perspective. He like blasts down into the ground, right? Which is the opposite of what we <laughs> saw in the Master Mold episode where Cyclops made his way up by shooting yeah. them outwards. Yeah. From there, you, you see a scene between Creed, who's sick, and the 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 guy who he doesn't know is Apocalypse yeah. yet, and he basically. He's in a little more of an angry like mentality than he was in the previous part because in, in part one he was kind of pleading. Scared, yeah. Whereas this one he's like, I can't be sick. I need to be there to direct events. Mm -hmm. And so, and but they kind of like leave it at that. So I guess we're supposed to infer or whatever we need to at that point. Well, I think that's the spot where he has started the mutant propaganda against Beast for infecting him. Mm -hmm. But he knows that the length of this virus is a few months. So oh, he yeah. can't be there to help the narrative. Because yeah. at the end of the day, Creed is very much like the propaganda mm -hmm. style of attack against mutants. He has other ones who are doing like the grunt work and the, the real dirty work. Mm -hmm. But he's the one who's leading the narrative. He's yelling the loudest. Well, he's, he's yelling the loudest and he's, he's manipulating. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for him, it's a matter of, well, I need to be there so mutants get properly blamed for this. Yeah. And... The, uh, right about then, Cable does appear with Wolverine and immediately zaps Apocalypse. It stuns Apocalypse long enough. Yeah. Most of that fight is also the same. 
Yeah, you you do get Cable who says, I don't even know who you are. It's very much a Thanos yeah. Scarlet Witch moment <laughs> in a way. He's like, I don't even know who you are. And he's the name's Cable. Remember it. And then he's going to say that after the commercial break, too. Yeah. Is there even a commercial break in between? It's really hard to know when you're rewatching this on Disney Plus. Yeah. Because if you're not paying attention for the commercial break, you don't actually get the break in the show. The only time I kind of notice is when there's like a, like a string or orchestra swell up. Or, or then- it's like the the one where bishop first appeared and you had the moment it cuts to commercial and then you get the exact same moment right yeah. after yeah. but they like they change the dialogue just like a little bit yeah you get the weird. tweak so the fight breaks out in a similar fashion apocalypse still makes his giant like jackhammer arm yeah. that, that shoots rogue up into the ceiling and again just shows how strong rogue is because mm-hmm. most of the other x-men would be dead if that happened yeah, this is their second tussle with apocalypse hand to hand right and also, like, the second time she has gotten thrown into, like, steel and made a dent in the yeah. steel from her body. And so all of it plays out the same until Bishop throws his little bomb thingy and it doesn't make it over to the virus tank beam in the sky thing or whatever. And they let Wolverine get thrown into it. Well, Wolverine was going to get pushed out of the way by Bishop. Oh, okay. And Cable stops him. And Bishop is like, what the hell? And Cable can't explain the entire thing fast enough, but it's like, you have to let him get infected. Yeah. So everybody's freaking out because they're like, you killed him, you killed him, because you can see the virus starting to spread the same right. way and it, before. And because he's like literally getting hit with the super concentrated <laughs> right. like vat of this shit. And I guess the world supply, right? Apparently it's, in, like, it's the, the world <laughs> supply is, is in this room and then the tanks in the subsequent room yeah. behind it. So that's when Bishop throws the incendiary grenade and that's what destroys the virus. Cable gives his second, remember the name, <laughs> to Apocalypse and everybody basically like fucks off at that point. Apocalypse is, is defeated, but unlike the part one version of it, he just kind of goes into an energy shield and just like, like teleport yeah. or levitates away, not even teleport. Yeah, he like does like a Magneto thing. Yeah, Magneto bubbles. <laughs> you know, bubbles. It sounds like a like a kid's product or something. I have notes from our show of shit I never want to say in the real world. <laughs> so obviously Wolverine does heal. They can see him healing from it, and Cable explains like that that's why they needed that all to happen. Right. Yeah. So they're they're all getting out of there as the the lab is getting destroyed. Bishop, as they're running out, time jumps away. Doesn't even say goodbye. Just. To be like honest, I don't think they really want him to say goodbye. They're right. like, can you stop? Cyclops turns around yelling at air. Yeah, he's just shooting at air. <laughs> just optic blasting nothing. And so Bishop goes back to this, pretty much the same point as all the other times with Forge. And, and the future sucks again. Yeah, and he's like, he's like, but I stopped the plague. And Forge is like, what plague? <clears throat> it's like, oh, God, okay. <laughs> but, and they don't elaborate. No, there's no elaboration. So it's like, nope, 2055 <laughs> still sucks. At what point do you say, is it me? <laughs> well, it's it's like there's a whole philosophical thing of what's meant to happen will still come to pass. So this is the second time it made no difference. Yeah. Like similar outcome, just different shitty situation. Right. And back in modern day, Beast is at the mansion. Wearing a green polo shirt. Yeah. This is very daddy mode. And <laughs> thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, dude's cut, right? So, and he, he says that the antibodies that Wolverine's body produced will cure the plague. So it, it if it wasn't clear before, g- getting Wolverine infected made it so that they didn't have to have a bunch of mutants die from the virus to, to what, like balance or regulate the mutant genome or whatever and stuff. But yeah, still the, the, was able to do it. The mutation from his antibodies, which Beast is going to continue to study, will end up saving the mutant genetic code from over mutating people, essentially. Which, if this was a real world thing, like that, Wolverine would be dragged into a lab and they'd be injecting with everything known. I think that's the reason why they, the X-Men don't tell other right? people about Wolverine's <laughs> power. Because at that point, it's like inject him with cancer and shit. Like, I mean, they kidding. literally, okay, let, let's, <laughs> let's flash back, Rod. Yeah. Canada put oh, that adamantium right. into his skeleton. That is right. So, they did yes, try they that. did that already. They did try that, yeah. They're like, oh, I wonder why Wolverine didn't die. Oh, because he <laughs> heals from everything. And then we finally, to cap everything off, we, we catch up with Cable in the Cable future. This is in 3999. He arrives in his future. His son, Tyler, is safe. We don't know anything else. Just happy ever Hugs. after. 
yeah, yeah hugs and yep. love was the answer and don't future, do future still probably sucks but hugs yeah right yep. we'll find but out it, I guess but his writers. son is still alive and that's all cable gives you <laughs> about there is no magneto and xavier in the savage land in these two episodes i was waiting for that yeah it never happened and i, I think it's just because how packed they are mm-hmm. but i could also see because you're dealing with timeline stuff mm-hmm. it could be confusing yeah because does does the event still come to pass if they're still in the Savage Land. And it's two parts. Right, exactly. So it, it, it definitely has a lot of confusing stuff. I got some random facts, but before that, what do you think of, of the this one? Like This was more of what I remember Days of Future Past being like. So I think you just confused Days of Future Past. I think I just melded them together. Yeah, as, as one yeah. four giant part episode. And I don't even know if I saw both of these episodes because... I, I'm just gonna admit, like I'm younger. Rod was not any less of a goldfish, so <laughs> I, I probably, may, I might have even started watching the second episode and just thought it was a repeat. Just thought it was the first episode. I might have not finished. I don't. I can't say that for sure, but I would not be surprised if I didn't watch one of these episodes because I thought I was repeating the previous one. I I distinctly remember moments from both of them. I I distinctly remember the giant apocalypse killing everybody. The reaction of Cable at the end of, oh, I have to work with Apocalypse to save my future. Mm-hmm. And then I, I definitely remember the scene of Wolverine being infected. I and remember that part. Yeah, yeah. So I this this is one I don't think I think it's one of those episodes I didn't see it a lot, but I definitely remember that, you mm-hmm. know, from 30 ish years ago. <laughs> so some interesting stuff, Rod, that I would love to get your your thoughts on. In one of the the interactions, Wolverine calls Bishop old Scarface because of the symbol on Bishop's face. What does that symbol mean? I don't know. Well, do you remember what the symbol is? This is like a triangle thing, right? It's it's specifically an M. Oh, that's right. It is an M. So he, in the future, is branded because he's a mutant. So even though he was one of the trackers, it was always obvious that he was a mutant. I'm pretty sure they did it by like literally branding people's yeah. faces with a laser or something like what that. Bishop got it, so it like looked really, like he looked really badass. I think they, from <laughs> from the stuff I've seen in the comics, they did it to everybody from his timeline okay. who who was born in essentially the mutant camps. Mm-hmm. So. so once again, subtle parallels. To they they consider this episode a direct sequel to Days of the Future Past. I mean, I don't think that is a shock, especially because yeah. it literally showcases the moment as Bishop arrives back and Forge is like, what did what, yeah. what'd you do? I guess it, with the exception of Xavier not being around, it, you could just watch it right after Days of Future Past and it make complete sense. Yeah, and... and you know, because the show has had episodes that just completely don't have a character featured in it, I don't think it would actually shock you too much because mm-hmm. there's nothing majorly significant of any of the characters that is addressed in the show. Because the, the episode is really Bishop and Cable is our mm-hmm. story here. And a little bit of Friends of Humanity, but yeah. for the most part, we've seen mostly everybody at this point. I guess I just mean like it's, it was something as high stakes as like two different time travelers and stuff. Somebody probably been like, what does Xavier think or something, you know? Yeah, or why isn't he in DC or something? Yeah, right. <laughs> but there's so much going on and packed in there. One significant aspect of Cable is how did Cable survive for 2,000 years? And it's that's that was kind of like one of the questions posed by Eric Leewald is... Like to know... Well, oh, oh, well, because from... we Yeah, at the beginning, we don't know he comes in as a time traveler. Yeah. We just see him in the future, and then you get the little bit of a reveal that he yeah. has... He's, he's actually transporting through time. He didn't just survive for 2,000 yeah, years. Yeah. With regard to the time travel, it kind of t- like leads to to what I was saying about like, you know, what has come to pass will, but it also has an unforeseen consequence because even though Bishop's timeline seemingly had no change, it was, the, it was just a different set of circumstances yeah. that got them there. The unforeseen circumstance is it unmade Cable's future. Yeah, so is this like a like more long term thing? It just went. Yeah, for it's thousands it's, of more it's years. like the butterfly effect for for Bishop's future. Fifty years in the future is well, sorry, sixty years in the future is relatively insignificant because mm-hmm. it's still just shitty future. It as it ripples over time, the ripples get bigger and bigger to the point where Cable and and all of his compatriots don't get born yeah. essentially and to anybody that 
is only is only familiar with like current Marvel MCU stuff. This is before multiverse stuff was in like the animated show. And so I don't even think the animated show had multiverse stuff going on. So this is a singular timeline. Yeah, I I don't think they really touched multiverse in in the TV stuff. In the comics, multiverse was was addressed. It was addressed mm-hmm. in a little bit of a different scenario. You had what if as a series. Yeah. And what if was just kind of like the alternate timelines. Yeah. And then you started getting bigger, more elaborate ones, like the Age of Apocalypse as an alternate timeline, mm-hmm. which is the timeline where Professor X was killed and Magneto takes up the helm to mm-hmm. become the lead on the X-Men. And what does the death of this one person end up having across, yeah, the- you know, and literally it's it's the destruction of the world as you know it if, mm-hmm. if Xavier died at that timeline. So yeah. Eric also said it is probably one of the only scenarios or at the very least at that first time ever where plague antibodies were such a major aspect in the plot of a series, especially an animated series at that point. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> right. <laughs> The cool Easter egg from the episodes, the patient list that McCoy is looking through is actually members of the crew and their family. So if you if you pause and you look at those and then you check out the IMDb of the show, you'll see lots of crossover with with those people. That's cool. Um, You got cast as somebody's going to die. Yeah. (laughs) All these people have the plague. And then the final one, seeing Ileana with the with the virus in the comics she actually dies in a similar faction Ooh. to a virus that is known as the legacy virus. I think I vaguely remember that. I also mentioned, because there was the the plague that infects the, the Morlocks, mm-hmm. where it was Gambit who got infected by that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, loaded episodes. Very loaded episodes. Rod, have fun editing this. Right. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. I, I really like the Days of Future Past timelines, which I are stories that I include this as part of it. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you did too. Thanks for joining us. If you have any thoughts, make sure to drop them in the comments for either the YouTube upload or the official Instagram post about this episode. If or like, the real. Or the, the real. Please yeah, use the real. Instagram I want, reels. I want our reels to just crush it. <laughs> if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate your rating on the podcast app of your choosing. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and CastBox, and apparently mobile versions of Facebook. Everybody's um, favorite podcast app. Right. <laughs> Don't fuck up Storm, back by popular band. <laughs>